So I'm Scott Moulton. I do computer forensics as my day job. I also run a data recovery company. So a lot of you probably know me from uh, some of my other speeches, which are all animated. I do all those nice, rich, expensive uh, animations for hard drives and solid state. And uh, while this speech isn't actually animated, I do have another one later this afternoon at 6 o'clock, which is all about solid state hard drives that is animated. But one of the things that some of you might not know, if you submit a speech to Black, to, uh, Black Hat, if they reject you, they send you the comments that other people who are paying people actually you know, make statements about your presentation. So I submitted this one to Black Hat, and the comments I got back when they rejected me, there was one guy who says, you know what, I would really like to see an animated version of a computer forensics guy taking a PI exam. So he thought it was pretty funny, put ha ha ha. So I said something to my son about that, and. Uh, and he turned around and made us this. So this is going to be the extent of animation in this presentation. <laughs> so there you go. <clears throat> and that was... That's done by Brandon right here in the, in the, there you go. Thank you, Brandon. All right, so let's start off. So outside of that, this is not animated. So if you want to see the animated stuff and all the bazillion dollars of that, that's this afternoon. Uh, and then the other thing I want to make sure is I am not your lawyer. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not going to be your lawyer. You can call me for defense work or something. I'll help you out. But uh, so you got to do all your own work to try to figure out what's legal in your states. And I'll tell you what, there's a lot of gray area. There's a lot of stories saying, oh, it's good this day, but it's not good this day. So you're just going to have to trust me on that and make sure you talk to your lawyer. Uh, and I'm pretty sure there's going to be a lot of angry people about this stuff. And keep in mind, I did not, I am not the person who's trying to do this legislation. So don't throw stuff at me. I just happened to be the first person that was actually tried to be removed because of this legislation two years ago. So just keep that in mind. Don't get all angry and throw stuff at me. The, uh, the real story here is if you want to do something about it, you should really try to have tech people becoming politicians because in the near and short future, that's all we're going to have. If no tech people get involved, there's not going to be any solutions to any of these problems. So this is for your entertainment. So why this speech is important to you. The, the first thing is, is that in a lot of states and a lot of different places, these laws are going into effect with no grandfathering. They're taking place immediately. And uh, I wrote this speech months and months ago before other issues like Michigan and stuff have come up. But uh, I've been anticipating that this was going to be a problem for about two years. And I've been posting on boards and every place I can post for the last two years. So a lot of you can see that if you just Google my name or do something. But uh, this is very important that they're coming in with no grandfathering, which means in about 30 days they pass these laws. Next thing you know, you're out of business. So if, if anybody, how many people in here are doing computer forensics? Wow, that's a pretty good amount of people. How many in here are doing it for a private third-party company? That's about a half of that. So that's the big issue. If you're doing it for an internal company, something like AT&T or someplace like that, technically you're not violating the law. But if you're going outside of that, you're violating the law. So if this passes in 30 days and you didn't even know about it, you're out of a job. One more time. How many of you are already PIs? Oh, that's a really low number. What, two, three people in the whole room? So, besides me. So, <clears throat> and then the other thing is, is that in a lot of cases, the PI board is just making one change. They're trying to change what is currently a misdemeanor to a felony and then going after people saying that we didn't make a big change in the law. All we did was make it now a felony for the things that already were a PI and then trying to apply it to computer stuff. So you're going to find that out here in a few minutes. Uh, most, most of this people just do not believe applies to them at all. I've had a number of discussions with people that just say, well, that, I don't fit into that description. But when you start looking at the content and what it really means, if you are holding yourself out as a third party, you're doing anything for any legal purpose, then basically that ends up being the things that fall under that category. So there's a, there's a couple of things. We'll go through them. But uh, even people who do like uh, 
handwriting analysis and stuff, they believe that this does not apply to them, that there's one certification for handwriting analysis, and if you're going to testify in court, you've got to have this one certification, and that's all that, that applies to them. But a certification is not a professional license. There is a division there. Basically, professional licenses are done by states, and the states decide who's in charge. There's a board put in place, and then there's a charge, and there's a number of things you have to go through. A certification does not fit into that category at all, period. Sometimes a certification is used to get the license, but it is not the license. So I just want to make sure you guys are clear on that as we're going through this, because I'm going to anger some people about uh, you know, what the point of a certification is if you have to be a PI. So you know, these people just don't believe it applies to them. So this is an example of what just happened. How many people here are from Michigan? Okay, so there's a few. So how many people were aware that it's now a felony to do the crime of computer forensics in Michigan? Yeah, so there's only a few people who weren't. So right now, as of May 28th, going into effect immediately, passing in about 30 days, they basically changed the law to state, and they actually included the definition of computer forensics, but it took effect immediately the same day that they passed it, which was May 28, 2008. And now it is a felony. So the penalty is that you get a possibility. And if it's a felony, you're going to get at least one year in jail in most cases. Uh, and so up to four years and then a $5,000 fine. And if you've already been convicted of a felony, you can't become a PI. So you're kind of like after you're out, you can't even go get do the job you're already doing. So I think that's a pretty big deal. And one of the opinions about these laws that are starting to take place, people think that regulation is needed. I hear that all the time. It's like, oh, this is a good thing, that regulation is needed. And because you know that way the, the geek squad isn't stealing your personal private information because now they've got to be a, a PI. I don't know that's going to solve the problem because generally those aren't the people you're paying them, so they're not generally stealing your information. Uh, and then a lot of people, really, the PIs in most cases, have kind of a bad rep. When you say PI, you think, well, they're doing surveillance or something. So most people would accept the worst computer guy they know over a PI doing their work. And so that's an opinion I hear all the time. That's not my opinion directly, but uh, it's, it's, it's in there. <laughs> so, uh, and then a lot of people say that this is a field of science. And if it's a field of science, then why is it trying to fit underneath this PI wing where there is no science? There's nothing to the test. There's nothing from that standpoint that is scientific. So, and then as I stated earlier, people who do like question documents and handwriting experts, as they, as they leave whatever uh, legality, uh, the types of fields that they're working in, and they go into a third party and try to sell their skills and testify maybe for the defense or something, that's now becoming an issue. So these people just don't think that it applies to them. And it, it's kind of, if you're in a situation where the law applies to some people, but not, then not other people, and somebody can choose whether or not they're going to prosecute you or not, then typically you're looking at void for vagueness or something like that in some laws. Again, I'm not a lawyer, so. And then a lot of other people think that all PIs do is surveillance. So if they're doing surveillance, you know, how helpful are they going to be to you doing computer forensics or doing anything else? So this comes to my point, which is all of these certifications. How many people have at least one of these somewhere? That's pretty much the whole room, most of the room. Uh, somebody's got at least one of these certifications, and regardless of which of these certifications that you have, it is all trumped by this. If you go and you get your PI license, that is what is going to be what is enabling you on the stand. Now, I understand you can still be qualified as an expert, and you can still testify and not have to have the license. But after talking to several lawyers, the issue becomes you've just testified that you committed a felony. So now they just use your testimony in the prosecution of you. So they may allow you to testify, but basically this is going to be the first step now of are you a PI? If you're not a PI, then you know, get him out of the court because he's not qualified because he's not licensed by the state. So that becomes a major issue. So I, you know, basically this is a summary type email that I got from somebody because the whole point comes down to that this guy finds it shocking and narrow-minded that states think that computer forensics experts have to have a license in order to testify, but yet private investigators can have no clue about what's on the computer, but yet they are the only ones who can testify. So what he's saying here, and I agree with it wholeheartedly, this is what the whole thing is about, is that they are legally enabled to testify in a case even if they've never touched a computer. They have rights that you don't have, even though you may have been doing computers for 25 years. So that's starting to become a major issue, and, uh, and with some of the time frames it takes to become a PI, it's not a short issue either. So this is how I was introduced to this problem. 
In April of 2006, I was on the stand testifying in a criminal trial, and a prosecutor comes up and basically starts questioning me about whether or not I had a license and a PI, and I, I basically said, you know, no, I don't need one. It's computer forensics. I'm not a PI. And so he went down that whole list. But what had just happened, unbeknownst to me, is that, uh, that a few days earlier, four days earlier, in March, that the state of Georgia had basically passed a law making it a felony, and these, the type of content for the questions he was asking me basic, basically made it sound like you are now committing a felony, but it didn't go into play yet. It didn't go into effect. It didn't go in immediately like it did in Michigan, where I actually have friends who had to shut down their shop the same day. I have friends that already were doing computer forensics, already working on cases, and had to quit, and after two months still haven't clarified whether or not they're going to be a uh, private investigator or whether or not they can continue on the case they were already contracted to do. But in Georgia, they basically put it off until July 1st. So on July 1st, it was going to become a felony. And that was the big deal, is that at that spot in time, the prosecutor was trying to say to the judge, look, we already passed this. It's already going to be a law. It goes into effect on July, so he's not qualified. He doesn't have a license. Let's get him out of here so that he can't testify in our case. Uh, luckily, the judge allowed me to testify, and it wasn't quite a crime at this point, so I was kind of okay at that particular spot. Probably more because the, uh, the lawyer tried to explain what the law was to the judge. And the judge goes, look here, young man, I'm a, I'm a judge. I've been on this stand for 20 years. I don't need you to explain the law to me. So <laughs> however it works, it works. It worked in my favor. So. So basically, I started doing some research at this point in time. I'm trying to find out, well, I didn't even know anything about this law that he's now talking about. So as soon as I got off the stand, even though I was accepted, I better figure out what in the heck's going on here. So I started doing some research and went through the process, looked up forensics. So <clears throat> now I'll tell you, you know, obviously there's no Magnum CSI or, or Quint CPI or anything like that. But they did get Rockford files right. So at least, you know, with computer stuff, we've got some terminology. But... Uh, but computer forensics is a branch of forensics pertaining to legal evidence, and it's using computers and digital storage. And to me, that doesn't sound like anything that PIs were doing. It, they currently, at least if you thought, oh, well, I need to look at this computer, the first thing you thought was, let's call PI? I, I don't think so. That, that wasn't the way it was going. So then I started looking at the content for what was submitted as the bill. This is the actual bill. is HB 1259. And it was passed. It was submitted on February 6th and passed on March 30th. It was never posted anywhere else on any of the PI boards or anything like that or on any of the websites, only on your legislation page. So you have to pay attention to your legislation page. And now, obviously, you're going to have to start paying attention to anything that's submitted by any of the senators or Republicans for a PI license or anything that affects the current PI license. And they don't have one. that They just number them. So you're just not going to know right off the bat, oh, I need to always look for 1259 or something like that. You have to start reading what the laws are that are submitted and what the summary is. And if you see one that says private investigators, you've got to look that up and make sure that it doesn't affect you and that they're not making changes that are a big deal. And sometimes they don't use the word computer forensics or digital at all in the law. They didn't in Georgia. So you have to read it and see if it applies to you by using you know, a number of different things or talk to your lawyer. But one thing I want to point out here is that uh, in, on the morning of the 30th, they, uh, they basically tried to pass this. It didn't, it didn't pass. They had a couple of nays. And then all of a sudden, bam, in the afternoon, they got those people to agree. I don't know what they did, but somebody talked to somebody and got somebody to agree we need to pass this law. So somebody got some payoff or something. I don't know. Uh, so, so after researching this, I was already working with uh, a couple of criminal attorneys and stuff like that. So basically, I put this stuff in front of them. And I said, all right, you know, if you were prosecuting somebody for this, what, what do you think about it? And so, you know, of course, he'd, he'd like to take my money, so it's okay. Uh, but outside of that, he said, I wouldn't want to have to try to, to prevent you from going to jail for this. There's a high probability that you might go to jail once this actually goes into effect if you continue to practice because it is a felony, and once you have a felony, you're in trouble anyway. So, so uh, at least right now, it was a misdemeanor. The same law still applied. All they were doing was changing this one word to felony, and so it was a misdemeanor at that point in time, which they could, I guess, go back and try to, uh, to get a $500 fine from you or something like that. But, uh, but the question becomes, in either case, who wants to be first? Who wants to be the first one to go and try that out? And uh, if you really want to know, if you refer to port scanning, uh, how many people know what I mean by that? So 
in port scanning in 2000, I was the first person arrested for port scanning. I was working for a government agency and scanned the ISP that actually supplied service to the government agency, and next thing I know, I was arrested. And so, uh, and uh, Theodore has, has their new MMAP book out. How many bought Theodore's book? No. He sold out really fast, so, you, you know, that's only two, three people have it. But page 14 and 15 of his book applies to me. It's, uh, it's all about a portion of my story going through this. So if anybody bought the book and wants me to sign, I'll do it. But uh, what you need to do <laughs> is go get Theodore's signature, too, so, and convince him to print another 1,000 books or something. It's a great book. So anyway, whoever wants to be first, that's what you got to do. And the other thing is, too, is to defend my case for something. Who thinks port scanning is illegal? It's illegal? Illegal? You're okay with it being illegal? No, I'm saying it's illegal in South Carolina. Okay. It's illegal in South Carolina. And is it illegal anywhere else anybody knows of? Florida. Florida. Port scanning is illegal in Florida. Okay. What's that? <laughs> you can marry your sister in South Carolina, but port scanning is illegal. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, just so you know, for me to defend my case for something that I would have never in 2000 declared illegal, it cost me $100,000. So, even though I'm right, I won, it was released, and basically, you know, they declared it wasn't a crime. And if you actually look that up, you'll actually see the judge says port scanning is not illegal. And so they say it's not a crime. So, that's what it's going to cost you if you're going to be first, if you get charged with a felony, because you've got to go through a number of different things, and you're also going to be like trying to sue like a a board, a representative of the state, and that's a big deal too. So I want to show you what the law looked like, basically. Uh, basically right now, private investigations is a business of obtaining, furnishing evidence, blah, 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 with the relation to background, identity, habits, conduct, business, employment, op occupation, assets. I mean, this is pretty much everything. I mean, who has a computer that you don't think that's going to tell something about you? Every time I look at a computer and deal with a case, I can tell a number of different things about somebody just from the way they type or what they look at. So, and if, if that's not one of those, I don't know what is. So basically, that's what they're declaring. Yeah. Yes, I believe computer security applies to this a lot, but every time I talk about computer security with regards to this, I get a number of arguments. Because you have a different set that you're dealing with. So for instance, if you work for AT&T and you're doing a pen test in your own company, in a lot of cases you're completely fine and you're legal. But if you're ISS and you're doing a pen test for a third party company and you discover these things, but the question comes down to is it going to be used for a legal purpose? That's the ultimate thing. If it's coming down to being used for a legal purpose, you may not know that it's going to be used for a legal purpose when you start. So you may end up having a case. So, for instance, somebody comes to you and says, oh, I just want to know what happened on this computer, but it's not going to be going to court. And so you look at it and you go, okay, fine. I see this guy was looking at porn. And then the person who you reported to goes and fires the guy. Now, he may not be wanting to take it to court, but then the guy that got fired now says, oh, well, I don't like how you did this and you treated me wrong. I'm now going to sue you. Now you're going to court. So did you now commit a crime, even though they declared that maybe it wasn't going to go to court? So you got a gray area there you got to deal with, and that's a big problem too, So because it's not well defined from that standpoint. But yeah, security applies to this a lot, uh, and in Texas they actually define it. Um, so the securing of evidence in the course of the business to use before a court board or officer, blah, blah, blah. So this is the defining point. If you're going to use this for some reason, and of course a board or, you know, an officer or somebody could also be an especially investigating committee inside of a, a company. But if you suck at computer forensics, at least uh, if you get your PI license, you can now become a bodyguard. So you, not a bounty hunter, a bodyguard. There's a different license for the bounty hunter thing. So, yes, sir. Um, Again, some of that is a gray area, but in most cases for electronic, he asked if, uh, how does it apply to electronic discovery? In a lot of cases, it's the same thing. In other cases, it, the electronic discovery component is actually working inside of the law firm. And if you are an employee of the law firm, and only that law firm, firm you are covered, you are fine. If you are a third party and you're doing discovery, you may have another problem. So, yes, there is some gray area, again, where it's not easily defined, and I've seen it in other states where it has become a problem. So, 
unless you only work for one company. If you're only working for like AT&T, but then when you want to go third party, he's saying get your PI license or you're fucked. That's what he said. So, yes, pretty much. Uh, unless, you know, if you work for AT&T and you work inside the company, I'm, not, I'm just using AT&T as a, I'm not related or officially, you know. But that's just the point is that if you're inside a company, you're okay for just doing it for that company. When you step outside of that company and you want to do it on the weekends for yourself, you want to start your own company or do something else like that, now you have to look at what the requirements are to be a PI and whether or not you actually fit into that or you've got to spend two years working for a PI before you become one or if you're ex-law enforcement or something like that. So, yes. So, basically, this is a list of the qualifications for Georgia that if you want to become one. And the points that I'm trying to make here is that you have to work for a detective agency in Georgia for two years. Michigan, it's three years. You know, each state has their own, their own list. And then the other thing is at least two years' experience as a supervisor, administrator, in in-house investigations. And I can clarify that typically that does not mean IT investigations. There's some things coming up you'll see in a minute. But ultimately, they mean the security guard who sits behind the counter looking at the little video screen watching you come through the door. That's what they mean. He is the security administrator in-house investigator. That's who they mean. Not you sitting there at your computer looking at stuff. They may allow you. The board may rule that you are okay with your uh, skills, but typically not so much. So... uh, and then your other option is obviously you've already been a law enforcement, which, you know, how many law enforcement guys are working only on computers? Psh, I don't know. So, or a four-year degree in criminal justice. How many people got that? Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Woo. We got two or three people we can call. I think I spotted the Fed. <laughs> <laughs> Spot the Fed. So... So I just want to say something about some other states, so like Nevada. Nevada has a similar requirement, but this is one of those where someone actually questioned them about whether or not IT investigations applies to being able to get your license just because you've been doing computer security. And they basically said they do not count computer forensics towards the required experience for a private investigator. So they have clarified, at least on one front, you might have to go state by state to ask them. It may be different in each state, but I'm just saying there's so many variations. Uh, they want to have it both ways. You got to, you know, they want to buy you, but you, you know, you, you're basically paying them to be your friend. That's what's happening here. So, all right. So, and then I was going to say, from a standpoint of the people that this applies to, it does not apply. There's actually specifications in the law that say it doesn't apply to these people. So, for instance, it doesn't apply to like an insurance agent or an insurance broker or someone who does some, you know, credit card stuff like Choice Point or something. Uh, you know, people who actually have sold your information to other... Anyway, regardless of that, um, (laughs) I'm just pointing that out that it doesn't apply to any of these people. But they basically forgot to exclude CPAs and other professional licensed organizations. They ignored them altogether. They just didn't mention them at all. So now if you're going to change the law, that's going to be a big deal because now those people aren't one of the above that the law applies to, even though they should have been excluded. So basically, when it's sitting on the governor's desk, this is the point is that the bill basically passed House and Senate. It's sitting on the governor's desk, and it didn't go into effect immediately, so it wasn't a law yet. So the, the governor has an option to veto the law before it becomes a law, uh, which didn't happen in Michigan. It just went into effect. So bam, you're there. So, of course, I find this out, and it's, uh, and it's only like two days later, so it's like April 6th or something like that. And I made a gugillion phone calls and emails and called everybody I knew on the planet. And then, basically, this, basically, this is what would have happened if we were not able to get this law vetoed. So, basically, we're looking at the fact that we could be imprisoned for not less than two years, five years, it's a felony, and you get your fine. So, of course, I'm calling everybody I know, trying to get rid of this thing. So I see the pr- – I, now, I am not on, like, the list of things that the president of the Board of PIs or the president of GAPI, which is the uh, Georgia Private Investigator Association, were sending out. So people started forwarding me these things as they were getting them. They're like, oh, now all of a sudden everybody's up in arms and they're my friends. So now they're sending me things to help me try to fight this in April 2006. So I got this. And basically it says, um, you know, the governor's office, I heard from today, blah, 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 that, the, uh, that this bill, HB 1259, has perceived unintended consequences. And if we don't hurry up and do something, 
basically what's going to end up happening is that we're, we're going to have no hope of getting this bill through. So they got more than 100 emails and phone calls, and it's his guess how this got started, blah, 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 as much as anybody else's. So basically, he lost. He, he, that basically got defeated. Hundreds and hundreds of people, CPAs, groups of people had called in, and the law got vetoed. Uh, <clears throat> So at least at, you know in this phase, and it's not me alone. Hundreds of other people got involved. So at least from that standpoint, you guys at least can make a difference by making people aware and just badgering people to death for days and days and days. So I we did this in about two weeks. So we got lucky. You want a brute force attack then? Yes, it's a brute force. <laughs> brute force with dial-up. <laughs> That's how you do it. Because because later on I heard that they said they got no emails. Well, obviously that's not true. So somebody got rid of those. But the hundreds of phone calls they couldn't get rid of, okay? Because there was at least a thousand emails that I know of. So, yes. Well, as soon as I got the CPAs involved, the CPA they basically blasted them to death. So, and then there was some meeting, and the CPAs got invited to with the governor that I didn't get invited to. But anyway. So, so basically, this is what the governor decided, and this is what he stated as to why the, the bill got vetoed. It's to expand the penalties from a misdemeanor to a felony without revising the definition could result in unintended consequences. Therefore, I veto the bill, Governor of Georgia. And so, at least from that standpoint, you know, CPAs and a number of other people, including things like, uh, you know, there's, there's a number of different categories of things like maybe DNA testing labs or something that may be affected by these things who don't have a professional license, don't have a doctor on staff or something like that. Um, so there was a lot of others I had heard about. But some people just viewed this as, okay, we defeated them and we're done. We don't have to be computer, you know, we don't have to become a PI or something like that. So they misunderstand that all that changed was the one word from a misdemeanor to a felony. That's what changed. They're still saying, and there is an HTCIA video on the day after it was videoed, where uh, the president of of Gappy and or the president of the Georgia Board of Private Investigators and the senator that sponsored this bill showed up basically and had a discussion and basically told us all. Uh, they started out the conversation by saying, "We didn't in intend to affect any of you. None of you are going to be affected by this." And then by the end of the conversation, they kind of switched roles and said, "You all have basically committed a mis misdemeanor, a crime, and so you're just upset because now it's going to be a felony." So you guys can all watch this video. I swear it's out there, or I'll publish it if it's not out there. I'll, I've got it. So, so that's basically the point. Is that again? It's, you know, refer to port scanning. Who wants to be first? Who wants to be the first person to challenge this? They wanted to get it accepted anyway, even with these other, in, you know, consequences, but they got vetoed. So, so at least from a standpoint of the other fields that may be affected, you got handwriting analysis, I already mentioned, medical testing labs. Uh, I mean, if they don't meet this qualification, I don't know who does. They take money, they're a third party, they use science to tell if a person has a habit. That's pretty straightforward right there. Oh, he's a druggie, yeah, okay. So, so anyway, they, if they don't have a doctor on staff, not professionally licensed, it could be a problem. Telecom investigators. I mean, they, they are third party typically because they're, they're specialized. They may move from one area to another depending on who's hiring them. You got for, forensic photographers. I mean, a bridge falls down, they go take a picture, and then they come back and try to use it in court. They don't have a professional license. There's no, I'm a professional forensics photographer. So at least from that standpoint, there may be some problems. Uh, and then uh, one of the senators or something sent me this list, uh, repo men, bondsmen, bounty hunters. They actually have a separate license for bondsmen and bounty hunters, but I don't believe it's a professional license. It's a one-day class. You get this little certification. So there may be some other thing. I don't know about repo men. That one's, that one's a little touchy. But at least from that standpoint, there are others that can be confused. And if you have this big a gray area and no one can decide, I call that a big problem. So... So this is what we try to do about it. Over the next year, a bunch of us who are leaders in the field, some people from large companies that I, you guys would know if I named them, basically we created this group that's called Digital Work Forensics Working Group. And we got the senator who originally submitted the bill for the PI board to say that he would work with us, that he would work with us instead of the PI board, and he would submit a law on behalf of us if we wrote one to either create or try to do something maybe with a new board or to submit a law that basically excluded us or whatever we wanted to try to write. If it was, if it was feasible and logical, he would submit it. 
So then the day that you had to submit these things, all of a sudden, even though we wrote a bill, we sent it to him, it was all confirmed. He says, I got it. We're good to go. He submitted the PI bill again the next day, the original one with some changes to it that now actually declared that we were digital forensics people were now involved. So, so basically, I'm like, what the heck happened here? How did he just all of a sudden stab us in the back, turn around? You waited a year and delayed us by a year. So I sent this to one of the House GOPs who was kind of a friend of mine who's actually talked to me several times about this issue. He says, I spoke to Aubrey Milanes, a lobbyist for the private detectives tonight and told him I was interested in this issue and suggested that we have a meeting of all parties to, to talk about this bill, basically, and he agreed. And this is the first time I had seen this guy's name. So I'm like, you know, I'm curious about this Aubrey Villanes guy, because is, is he related to John Villanes, the president of the private investigation board? Hmm. Bam, they are brothers. So... I guess not. I'm learning a lot about the political system as we go. Because let's face it, you know, as computer guys, most of us, what's that? That's a felony. So as a computer guy, most of us just go, I don't really care what they pass as far as the law. We work the system. We figure out a way around it. We do what we got to do. Well, now this is a prime example of us not being able to. There you go. It is on the DVD, by the way, or CD that you got from DEF CON as well. So it's on there. I've published this. So, and on many boards. Yes, there you go. So, but, you know, this bothered me quite a bit. And, you know, is it illegal? Probably not. I mean, he's a lawyer, and he was hired by the private investigators board. But here he is trying to pass laws and get senators and stuff to agree with him to, for, to benefit his brother directly So and help his businesses. That seems a little, you know... A conflict of interest to me, but I don't know. So anyway, this was the new bill that was submitted. It's called House Bill 504. This has been what was submitted the last two years. It did die on the vine this last time. No one, uh, they didn't vote on it or do anything. I can tell you it's going to come back. I know it's going to come back, especially now that Michigan has passed this law, because what happens is the states go, hey, you know, these guys passed the law, and uh, it's also a felony in, in Texas, but uh, there's a couple of states. South Carolina. But uh, there's some problems there, obviously, with uh, if they passed a law, now you've got to start, you know, all the other people are starting to say, well, we're applying to the National Board. We're doing what they're supposed to do. Let's go do the same thing. They did it. We need to do it. So that's what's happening here is basically they submitted this House Bill 504 for the last two years, and it basically says that it's uh, anybody who's you know, information including but not limited to any type of digital or electronics information. So at this point in time now, they're not even just saying computer forensics. Now they're saying anything. So that does include pen testing and other stuff like that. Or, uh, you know, who knows, uh, maybe, you know, check 21 or something like that because now it's all digital. I mean, there's a number of things now where things are going to be applied because they're digital. So we may start having some problems there. Yeah, I mean, it could be anything that's used for a legal purpose, obviously. There's a lot more to this, so you need to look up House Bill 504 and read it. Uh, and it didn't pass, so they're going to modify it and then resubmit it again. But, uh, but at least from this standpoint, yes, it could be anything that has to do with digital or electronic information that's for the other three categories, going to be used in a court or blah, blah, blah. So, so on and so on. So, and this time, they did specifically exclude professional practices. So anybody else who has a license in some other field that is a professional license by the board. They basically nullified that issue. They eliminated corporations and things like that. So basically now they've limited it to the scope of just third parties. So now it's the companies who are reselling their skills to someone else. Those are the only ones now that are in, in trouble, according to the new definitions. So this is, uh, I pulled this from, and the, the website is over here in the corner, investigation. Uh, investigation.com. This is a, a really good site. They have a whole map up of letters. This this uh, guy, Mark Kessler, basically has sent uh, a letter to all the states asking them whether or not computer forensics people have to be private investigators. And this is just one clip from the one from Georgia. And so even though technically, like I said, they've only changed the word from or tried to change it from a misdemeanor to felony, they're stating right here clearly that the board does require computer forensics 
firms to be tech and technicians to be licensed to perform their duties to the public, blah, blah, blah. So this is like your written information for that. And there's other states up there on that list. If you go to that, they have like a map and a, a whole bunch of letters. And you can go read what they say. Keep in mind, some of them may be outdated now because they may have changed since the letter was submitted to them or written back to them because it takes the state like a year to write a letter. So... <clears throat> So let's talk about some of the various states, some of the other states I know of things that are going on. So uh, South Carolina says it requires a license and will hunt you down. I've actually heard something along the lines of the AG has basically said, if we ship evidence out of here and it goes someplace else and you investigate it, even if it's in your own state, that we're going to hunt you down. So that's, um, that's not a quote, so you guys have to hunt that down on your own if you want to find out what that is. So I'm not saying that it's 100% accurate from that standpoint. That's just one that I have heard through the grapevine. So you can follow up with that. Then you've got a couple other things like Alabama, Alaska, Missouri. They don't have a state PI licensing board, but they have cities that have the requirement. So now if you're going to get a license, you have to pay attention to what city you're in. Maybe in one city you don't have to have one, and in another city you do. So, And if there's two cities that require them, you've got to get two different licenses. That could be a big problem, especially in something as diverse as something like Alaska. I mean, how many, you know, how many different cities are going to go to to work in to... You know, where's your work going to come from as a third party? Then you have uh, South Dakota has no PI license but has a business license. I mean, this is how screwed up some things are. I mean, you know, from one state to another, you have no idea what you're dealing with. So if you're going to be dealing with digital stuff, you may be crossing state boundaries in most cases because who knows where it comes from. And if you're crossing a state boundary, now you've got to comply with that state, even if it's sometimes just a connection out of that state. So Washington State says if you interview people. They don't clarify what interview means, but if you interview somebody, you have to be a PI. So what does that mean? Uh, interview, interrogate. In most cases, it just means you talk to somebody. So client calls you and says, uh, my son's missing, and can you help? And you go over and look at their computer, and you take $10. So now you've interviewed them, and now you have to be a PI. But if a lawyer hired you, and he talked to the client and never talked to you, and gave you the computer and you investigated it, then you're probably okay. Again, not your lawyer. So, so here's some new developments. In North Carolina recently, some of you may have read about this thing because it was widely published that there was a big problem going on in North Carolina and I was aware of every step of the way here. Um, and they had this meeting that basically there was this whole thing that somebody says, okay, we, we all sat down and we all talked to everybody and the state now has agreed that we all need a separate license, that computer forensics is different. And to me, I'm looking at this going, something doesn't make sense here. You know, who did they sit down with? It turns out they sat down with the PI board. The PI board is the same people that they sat down with to say, oh, well, now we need a separate license. And, they, and the PI board supposedly agreed. So what does that mean? The PI board can only affect their own license, so therefore they may create another category inside their own license. You still have to be a PI. And the clarification I've heard several times is that there's already PIs who are already doing the job of computer forensics, and if you create a separate license, they're, they're not going to vote to say, okay, let's have a separate license, and I have to go get some more education and go do something else so I can get the separate license to do computer forensics. So I've already heard through the grapevine a number of times that the current PIs are not going to vote on having to change their own license in order for the current people to have to be. In other words, they're paying for you. You have to pay to be their friend. They're not paying to try to be your friend, okay? Saying it's in a fraternity or anything. So at least from that standpoint, you've got some issues. Um, the other thing is, is that if it's the PI board again that they've submitted this thing to, it sounds exactly like what happened to us in Georgia. In Georgia, we got to work with a, a representative, but the representative is working with the PI board. So we kind of got stabbed in the back. So that's probably what's going to happen here. I hope it doesn't. I hope they're able to actually create their own. But they only got the agreement of the PI board, not some state legislator or not some other uh, group of representatives So that I know of. So that's going to be a big problem. So then you got Delaware where it's confusing because I actually pulled this from the law. Basically, an investigator or agency shall not include any person employed as a computer forensic specialist. So they're saying a PI is, does not include a person who is, who is you know, physically uh, a computer forensics person. But then we got this letter from you know, Mr. Kessler again that says Delaware actually states you have to have a license. So who's right? I mean, Delaware sends one. And the state says another thing in their law. So another gray area somebody's going to have to fight on, and it's completely confusing. So uh, Andy Rosen, how many people know who Andy Rosen is? 
Okay, so uh, basically he created SMART and he basically, uh, his ASR data, um, he's, one of, he's one of the brightest and I consider him to be like the grandfather of computer forensics. And he's one of the brightest guys I know and he basically had to go and get a PI license. And this is what his statement was, is that the license had nothing to do with ethics, computers, chain of custody, evidence, uh, anything he's involved in. It had to do with guard dogs and administrative regulations. That's what his test was on. So this is starting to get a little bit absurd, especially since this is all this guy does, is computer forensics, write software, forensic software. So, and this comes from Kessler's notebook. And the reason that I bring in this one up is because if you look at this particular paragraph, however, if the computer forensic analysis, an analyst were to go to follow a digital trail outside of a company it contracted with, in order to find the nature, location, or identity of an intruder, they must be licensed to private investigator. So the first part, they say, well, if you're hired by a company and you work inside the four walls of that company, you are completely fine. And they actually declare if you're actually looking for somebody, some intruder on your server. So at least from that standpoint, they're saying, fine, you're good inside the own company. But as soon as you connect to something else, what does that mean? A DNS server? If I type ping Yahoo because I got something from a, does that mean that now I've got to be a PI? That's what this says. As soon as you connect to anything outside to identify the, the intruder, you now have a problem. So again, private investigator. Now, it's gotten worse because now most of you probably heard about this one. How many read this? That basically right now is the board has sent, or the state of Texas has sent letters to all the computer repair shops in Texas that says they're now in violation or maybe in violation of the law and that now they have to quit their business and go get a PI license which takes three years before you can come back and repair computers again. That's, that's starting to get really, literally the geek squad I understand got a copy of this letter that says that they physically have to go be or that they may be in violation of the law. Yes ma'am. Dell actually contracts third parties in most cases. They're not, Dell doesn't actually technically in most cases have their own people that I know of. They actually send people. What about like IBM Global Services or EDS? Anybody who does it for third party, that's always a problem. Uh, EDS, ISS, Deloitte and Touche. Deloitte and Touche may even be worse situation because they keep an expert like in another location and when they need them, they ship them to the state that they need. So at least from that standpoint, at least that's my understanding of it, that they may have to have a license in every state. So. Okay. He says that the they sent out a clarification letter last week, which I must have missed, that says that they are not requiring computer repair shops. That's probably because all the computer repair shops got together and started a lawsuit against the Board of Private Investigators. So, you know, right. But you still start getting into some of these gray areas where somebody's going to have an argument. In Michigan, they did not leave any gray area there whatsoever from that standpoint. They basically say computer forensics is this. And so computer forensics is now listed in their law. And it gets worse. Uh, you cannot hold a license for your company. So how many people are under 25 years old? Okay, some of you. I started my first company when I was 23. So uh, you cannot hold the license for your company as a PI, even if you meet all the other qualifications, unless you're 25 years old. So you can go get shot at in war. You can drink. You can go strip clubs, but you can't hold a PI license with minimal education to get this uh, unless you're 25. So that's a... I see big problems here. And then um, you have to obviously post bond and stuff like this. This starts to get into expensive stuff. <clears throat> and then the other problem that there's confusion, if you look, the title of this is, you know, basically in the law now they say a period of not less than three years following this on a full-time basis. And then you read the bottom part, investigation, law, criminal justice, or computer forensic or other computer forensic industry certif certificated study. That is, that's a real word. It's actually a real word. Certica certificated study. It's, it's not a Bush and a Gam thing here. Uh, it's a, <laughs> I'm the decider. Uh, anyway, so the computer forensic cert certificated study. But the problem is, is now not only who has a certificated study that's three years. I mean, anybody have a computer forensic that's three years? I don't think so. And then the other problem is that is acceptable to the department. That's an opinion. I mean, like some guy sitting at the top this week goes, ah, he's good, I like him. And next week it's like, oh no, he's a competitor because I am a PI and I'm in business too because I'm on the board and he's a competitor, Pfft, I don't want him. 
So they kick you to the curb. And, again, this is also the same thing with ethics boards and stuff like that. If they think you've done something wrong, they get to also revoke your license. So some issues there. And then I got this. Uh, this is a friend of mine who actually owns a company there who had to shut down his company on May 28th. And he keeps asking and has still up till now been asking Michigan what you need in the certificated study to, uh, to be a PI. And they keep saying, we really aren't sure yet. We don't know. We haven't decided what will qualify. So basically, they made a law, passed it, and they have no clue what they're going to do about who's going to be accepted. Who's the professional licenses? Okay. All right. So California basically, uh, they basically stated that the category of things, this is from the AG, so it's basically coming down the line and saying that you do not have to be a, a PI to be a computer forensics guy unless you interview people again. So once you interview people, bam, you got a problem. All right. So I pretty much decided at this point that I got to become a private investigator, so I'm going to go take the test. So I sent off some information to go find out what I need to study to become a PI. So this is from the vice president of the GAPI, the uh, uh, Georgia Association of Private Investigators. You're correct. There is no official study guide or study material available for the private detective exam. By Georgia, you know, blah, 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 the state requires the test, but they give you no guidance or any way, shape, or form to actually find out what the heck is on the test. No one wrote a study guide in 40 years that they've been around to say, I mean, professional license. I'm going to start a professional license. I'm not going to have qualifications for what that is. So, so I sent this to my friend, the senator. He goes, man, this is ridiculous. Do you mind if I share this with the Secretary of State? Dang it, did you not see? The Secretary of State gives this test. But I hope he helps out. I hope it works out. But don't they know? I was pretty sure that they would know they don't have, like, a book they're selling that says study guide. You can make money there, you know, sell a book. Is there a whole music circumstance? <laughs> should be. Yeah, their whole music circumstance. Well, this is not just in Georgia, trust me. It happens state by state. So here's just a quick idea about what's on the exam. They give you three sample questions. That's all they give you. That's, there's nothing, nothing else other than say what you need. But anyway, so weapons, calibers, blah, blah, blah. We've got to move on because we're cutting short here. So, so then you go through this. It's basically you know a number of different things with regards to whether or not this question's leading or something. So I get to this. How many times does computer appear? Big fat zero, none. Not the word computer anywhere on that test at all. There is no requirement for you to have to do anything. So this is what they tell you your subject area is, even though they don't give you a study guide. So you get legal information, observation, surveillance, guns, uh, e evidence, interrogating people. So I Googled all those. I put all those words into Google, and this is what I got. <laughs> so... And just so, you got interrogations, you got your guard dogs from Texas over there, you got some guns, and this is called client relations. <laughs> so, so basically, after you're done with all this, this is what it's cost me, basically. This is your breakdown of two years, of, you know, year by year, what it's going to cost you. So you're going to spend about two grand in your first year between insurance and all the other stuff, plus uh, 80 hours of your time and a number of other things working for someone else while you are making, you know, minimum wage. Because if they know they got you, I mean, what are they going to pay you? They're not going to pay you what you're making. So you're going to go through this process and make a lot less money. And then each year after you finally are done, this is about what it's going to cost you. And then you've got, you know, 40 hours or whatever of continuing education. So my real question now, after you've all gone through all this fighting, gone through weeks and weeks of training, and spent a lot of money on your own, uh, you know, who's going who's gonna to deal with certifications? If certifications, basically this could become the death of some of those certifications. Because who's going to say, hey, I got a CCE while you're on the stand if that's, you know, maybe that's a second thing. The first thing is going to become... And I understand there's a difference between, you know, how these things work and whatever, but, and that, you know, certification does not necessarily give you qualifications for your licensing and things like that. But this is really a big question because now it's kind of destroying these. Um, so my, my final thing basically here is the things that you can do because that's what I really want you to get out of this because we, we need to change the world. That's really the point. We've been sitting around and not paying attention and not doing stuff and working the system, and now they're getting to where they're changing the laws to affect our jobs and our businesses. So the first thing is you need to start thinking about whether or not you think we need a special license. Because if some tech people are not starting to work on politicians and start to become politicians, we're not going to make any advances. You cannot make a change just because you go talk to a board or you're hoping that that's going to happen until somebody gets in there and actually starts to take over some of these things that actually understands technology. We're going to have the tubes of the Internet. 
So that's basically what we're going to have every time we turn around, people that have no clue about what we're doing. So, and I want to make sure that you understand that, you know, you don't have to wait for somebody else to do it. You're somebody yourself. If you're not paying attention to your state and reading these things, and go to that legislation page, because if you're not paying attention to the legislation page, that's where you're going to lose. So, and then I got my references and blah, blah, blah. This is what Kessler's notebook looks like. You guys can go look at your own uh, and find out what that letter is. And that's it for me.